Hello and welcome back to Sex Ed for part two of our examination of new religious movements during the French Revolution. While the last episode was about the de-Christianization of France and the emergence of the cult of reason, in this episode we're going to be focusing more on the other new religious ideology that briefly blossomed in the vacuum that the Catholic Church left behind. While we've seen in earlier episodes that most new religious uh, movements tend to branch off from older religious traditions, we're doing a two-part episode here because the cult of reason and the cult of the supreme being both basically split from the French Catholic Church in the same time period and for similar reasons. They were both separate branches that went off in their own separate directions. As we mentioned briefly in the end of our last episode, the cult of reason and the cult of the supreme being would quickly come into conflict with each other. So if you haven't listened to part one yet, please go back and do so, since all the background information leading up to the creation of these two cults is largely the same. In the last episode, we briefly covered the war in the Vendée and the grisly actions taken by the revolutionary armies of France to crush Catholic opposition to the revolution. But we'd like to extend our heads up for this episode, since there will be a lot of violent content in here as well. While our last episode covered massacres and violence primarily in the countryside, as well as uh, sort of spontaneous mob action violence, uh, in this episode, as we start talking about the cult of the supreme being, we're going to be talking about Robespierre, the Committee of Public Safety, and there's going to be a lot more of the sort of iconic, classic French Revolution scenes, namely uh, the Paris mob and the guillotine. Politically, the people who would eventually become the cult of reason and the cult of the supreme being were pretty closely aligned. In simplest terms, the big distinction between the two was that what the cult of reason tried to do with atheistic beliefs, the cult of the supreme being tried to do with deism. While the cult of reason coalesced into being very quickly due to the actions of a lot of different people like Mamoro, Hebert, and Klutz, the cult of the supreme being is closer to some of the other groups we've covered in that they're a group that had one very clear central leader. So while we spend most of the last episode trying to provide some of the context in which these religions both emerged, this episode we're going to talk more about the history of one person, the founder of the cult of the supreme being, and one of the most well-known leaders of the French Revolution, Maximilien Francois Marie Isidore de Robespierre. Now, a lot has already been written and said about Robespierre, and even today he's an extremely polarizing figure. Um, he's someone that I've personally found fascinating to study for a long time, because there's so many seemingly contradictory things about him. He's been demonized and idolized by so many people, he's been condemned and lauded, and he's a symbol for ideas and forces that are so much bigger than any person can actually be. Uh, there's the old cliche that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and for me that expression never seems more true than when I'm looking at Robespierre. Uh, in his book, Interpreting the French Revolution, uh, which was written in 1978, uh, Francois Follette says the following about Robespierre, which I think is very important to keep in mind before we dive into his story. He says, quote, There are two ways of totally misunderstanding Robespierre as a historical figure. One is to detest the man, the other is to make too much of him. Robespierre is an immortal figure not because he reigned supreme over the revolution for a few months, but because he was the mouthpiece of its purest and most tragic discourse. So it's the dualism and the contradiction of Robespierre that I've always found so intriguing. There's so much to admire and so much to detest. Well, Robespierre is known much more as a political leader than a religious one. So much of what he did and so much of what he said uh, as a politician really revolves around his ideas about morality, about good and evil, uh, and about his, his values and beliefs. So without further ado, let's look at the life and career of the man that even his enemies referred to as the incorruptible. Maximilien Robespierre was born in 1758, a member of that growing and prosperous French middle class known as the bourgeoisie. From a young age, he excelled at school, and by 23, he had graduated from the University of Paris and was a lawyer, like his father and grandfather before him had been. Like a lot of the men who had become leaders of the French Revolution, he was extremely well-educated and, and had a very strong affinity for the ideals of the Enlightenment. We mentioned in the last episode the writings of men like Cicero and how French revolutionaries often read these old Roman sources and idealized and obsessed over the civic virtue of the old Roman Republic. And Robespierre was a prime example of this. He became infatuated, if not obsessed, with the ideals that, are, that he associated with the classical world. More than that, though, he studied the works of Rousseau. He came out of school believing deeply in democracy, equality, and the right of the French people to govern themselves, all the big lofty ideals that formed the backbone of French revolutionary ideology. In terms of his political and philosophical beliefs, 
he really doesn't stand out that much uh, as an innovator proclaiming new ideas, but more as a really great representation of a lot of common bourgeoisie, middle-class, liberal, enlightenment ideals. I think the thing that really does set Robespierre apart from all the other French revolutionaries is in part the fact that he is able to eventually become so powerful and influential, but also his long-standing status as sort of a true believer in the ideals of the revolution. Even Robespierre's worldview, even at the start of his career, he sees himself as somebody who always must do the right and virtuous thing. He's got very, very strong views of what is right or wrong, and that is really part of what earns him his nickname, The Incorruptible, because once he takes a moral stance on an issue, he becomes determined to do what he views as the right thing, regardless of who or what gets in his way. As you may already know, or possibly might have guessed, he's going to end up with a lot of blood on his hands once he's really in a position of power. But far from being the, the true sort of tyrant or dictator type in the way we sometimes think of them, um, not like a, a Stalin or something, he really is motivated by this philosophy that he's working for the greater good no matter what the cost to him or to anyone else. Right at the start of his legal career, Robespierre resigns from his job as a criminal judge due to his moral opposition to the death penalty. Since he is pretty well known for sending a lot of people to the guillotine later in his career, this is often mentioned just as an interesting trivia fact, or used to make him look like a hypocrite. But if you look at his statements about his opposition to the death penalty, he's pretty specifically referring to death penalties issued by the king. And there's a clear rhetorical and ideological consistency with this in his later views. In 1791, Robespierre wrote the following about the death penalty, quote, the first obligation of a legislator is to form and preserve public morals, the source of all freedom, source of all social happiness. When in running our particular goal, he turns away from this general and essential goal he commits the most vulgar and dire of errors. The king must thus present to the people the purest model of justice and reason. If in place of this powerful, calm, and moderate severity that should characterize it, they place anger and vengeance, if they spill human blood that they could spare, and that they have no right to spread, if they spread out before the people cruel scenes and cadavers wounded by torture, it then alters in the hearts of citizens the ideals of the just and the unjust. They plant, they plant the seed in the midst of society of ferocious prejudices that will produce others in their turn." End quote. Now that's a heavy statement in a lot of ways, and as you can tell, he talks like a lawyer um, most of the time. Um, and it is important, though, to look at that statement in terms of the cult he would later form, um, because you can see some connections right at the start of the quote uh, with the, the first obligation of a legislator is to form and preserve public morals. Uh, while that sentence doesn't mention sp religion specifically, forming and preserving public morals is something that will be central to his cult once he finds himself in control of the legislature later in life. Uh, another key word that Robespierre will use over and over and over is the word pure. Um, even when writing in his opposition to the death penalty, he leaves open the, the door for what he calls calm, uh, moderate severity. Um, moderate severity being, again, his tendency to say these sort of contradictory uh, concepts, uh, virtue and terror being a, a later one um, that is a bit more popular, but moderate severity is, is how he views the executions he'll eventually go for while criticizing those motivated by anger and vengeance. At least in his own head, that's part of how he justifies it. Uh, if you've heard in our last episode about the cult of reason, about people like the enragés, like Hebert, these angry and sudden mob violence, uh, like in the September massacres, that you can see this is one specific area where Robespierre and his Hebertist allies would eventually split. Robespierre is the, the calm, cold uh, violence as opposed to the, the angry, furious mob action. After resigning from being a criminal judge and digging his heels on a specific moral point, Robespierre became something of an activist for the poor in his hometown of Arras defending poor clients against those he viewed as oppressors, and using his time in court to espouse enlightenment ideals about the rights of man, as well as publishing political writings and, study, and studying politics more extensively. This work brought him a great deal of popularity among the people. When the Estates General was called in 1789, Robespierre managed to get himself elected as one of the deputy representatives of the Third Estate putting him right in the mix as the Estates General turned into the new National Assembly of France. 
Robespierre quickly became associated with the radical left of the representatives in the new assembly and stood out from many third estates bourgeoisie representatives due to his defense of the rights of minorities, particularly the Jewish and black people of France. And he arguably, uh, and he argued forcefully for their inclusion as full citizens, granted the same rights due to all men, arguably for universal manhood suffrage, though even he did not propose extending voting rights to women. Robespierre also focused on alleviating the desperate bread shortage, uh, which was one of the most pressing concerns of the lower classes, aligning himself and his politics closely with those of the enragés. Again, taking a moral stand against the more moderate and compromising views of many of his, reg of his revolutionary allies. There are many, many reversals in political power and influence that Robespierre would see after he arrived in Paris as a third estate representative. As we discussed in the last episode, the revolutionaries were by no means one united force, but Robespierre's habit of taking these you know, firm moral stances, regardless of how popular or unpopular they happened to be, um, was definitely something that helped make him a person to rally around in these times of chaos. Uh, as the various representatives were working on a new constitution for France, they were known as the National Constituent Assembly. And as a member of this assembly, Robespierre managed to propose and get past one of his signature achievements that would help establish his reputation and have a big impact on things to come. He essentially passed a measure that made sure that every representative who was working on the constitution for the constitutional monarchy that they were trying to make France become um, would be ineligible to stand for re-election uh, as soon as the constitution had been passed. And this was a move that would ultimately remove himself from power because he was one of the people helping uh, create that constitution. And it was viewed as a um, very principled stand that he's not going to, um, that he's going to remove himself from power in this way. But what ended up happening is that most of the uh, people who he opposed who were in that assembly with him were also removed from power. And the new elections brought in a wave of very young, inexperienced, and passionate representatives um, who were more radical and more closely aligned with his worldview. So it did ultimately work out in his favor politically and would sweep him back into power and there's a lot of debate about how much he anticipated this and I definitely think especially at this point he's more naive and principled than this master schemer. I think he he really was um, viewing that as the right thing to do and not necessarily expecting to be swept back into power quite as dramatically as he ultimately would be. Um, it's more of his naive optimism that do the right thing and everything will eventually work out. And uh, at least for a while, for him personally, it looked like that did. By September of 1791, the Legislative Assembly of France was the new government. This was the newly elected and much more politically radical assembly that Robespierre had called for, but was not part of. In spite of his staunch opposition, Robespierre could do nothing to stop this new assembly from declaring war on Austria and Prussia, a decision pushed through the assembly by members of a group known as the Girondins, uh, who were political revolutionary radicals like Robespierre's Jacobins, just slightly less radical. The king was still around at this point, and still technically king, though after having been arrested, fleeing, and forced to accept a constitutional monarchy, his power had diminished immensely, and he was in many ways under house arrest and increasingly unpopular. Austria and Prussia were both monarchies, and given the marriage connections to King Louis XVI, they were both seen as highly threatening to the revolution. Counter-revolutionary forces had begun to flee France and seek refuge in these other monarchies, and both Prussia and Austria had issued statements warning the people of France of their interest in defending the French monarchy. The revolutionary France was just itching for a fight at this time, and many people loved the idea of marching across Europe, overthrowing tyrant kings and spreading democracy and freedom. Robespierre once again took a strong stand against what would have been popular or easy, and denounced the idea of war the second it came up. As the war started turning against France and quickly became very unpopular, Robespierre managed to gain a lot more support for his sticking to his principles. In yet another famous speech, Robespierre argues against war, citing the examples of Oliver Cromwell and Julius Caesar, and how easily a successful general with the loyalty of an army can undo a republic and make himself dictator. In fact, since a man named Napoleon Bonaparte was at this time working his way up the ranks of the French military, it would seem like Robespierre definitely had a point there. 
uh, though he wouldn't be alive to see how prescient he was. Another major reason that Robespierre opposed the war was his desire to see an internal focus to keep working on turning France into the virtuous republic he so desired to see. In one of his anti-war speeches, he predicted that a military invasion of other countries would not bring about the result the pro-war faction predicted, with the oppressed masses joining their French liberators and embracing revolutionary ideals. As Robespierre put it, quote, the most extravagant idea that can arise in a politician's head is to believe that it is enough for a people to invade a foreign country to make it adopt their laws and their constitution. No one loves our missionaries, end quote. Unlike with his prediction of the rise of a military dictator, though, he would be very much alive to see his prediction come true. He's also the type who's up for an infuriatingly smug, I told you so. As Robespierre was making a name for himself in Paris, he first came into contact with his biggest fan, a very handsome, arrogant, angry young man with unmatched revolutionary fanaticism named uh, Louis-Anton de saint Jude, who would later become known as the Angel of Death. Introducing himself by letter uh, in trying to gain Robespierre's support for a petition in his hometown, St. Just wrote, You, who uphold our tottering country against the torrent of despotism and intrigue, you whom I know, as I know God, only through his miracles, it is to you, Monsieur, that I address myself. I entreat you to unite with me in saving my poor land. I do not know you, but you are a great man. You are not merely de the deputy of a province, you are the deputy of the republic and of mankind. And this would be a letter that Bruce Pierre saved uh, until his dying day in his office uh, for some reason or another. And his friendship with St. Juice would start right there, uh, and they would always be very close political allies for the rest of their lives. Um, and he would really become Robespierre's right-hand man, uh, one known for absolutely merciless attitude towards any enemies of the Republic, and um, definitely played a part in, in pushing Robespierre towards uh, violence. The phrase used in that letter, I think, also represents pretty well how the most ardent followers of Robespierre viewed him, and probably how he really liked to view himself as upholding the tottering country and also deputy of the Republic and of mankind. And the religious uh, phrases, you who am I know, as I know God only through his miracles, um, definitely it reflected a, a common connection that they had of uh, St. Just and Robespierre both um, not being afraid to use religious terminology even as atheism became more and more popular and religious terminology became less and less popular amongst their faction. Um, so while Robespierre was one of the leaders of this radical Jacobin faction, they were all pretty serious about democracy for the most part, and he was by no means the only leader. Buying for power within that faction of the Jacobins, there's also Georges Danton, who was another huge towering figure of the French Revolution, and I mean that both figuratively and literally. Uh, one of the things I really like about these French revolutionary leaders is how strange a lot of them looked physically. Um, last episode, I mentioned that fiery journalist Marat, who became uh, the martyr for the cult of reason, was suffering from a horrible skin disease and usually having meetings in, well, in a bathtub. But Danton was this huge individual with a shockingly ugly appearance. He'd been kicked in the face as a child by some sort of mule or other farm animal, and he also had permanent scar scars from smallpox all across his face. So he definitely stood out a lot in any crowd as this big, roaring, revolutionary giant of a man. And so into this sort of environment of political chaos and of all these many factions uh, all vying for power and all these people vying for power within all these different factions, um, Robespierre, with his habit of taking his stances like he always did and digging in his heels and uh, remaining consistent, was definitely in some ways the eye of the hurricane. He was something that people could rely on and they knew where he stood, and a play, person to rally around in that sense. But Danton was definitely um, the more outgoing, the more popular, the, the one who would, you know, people would actually want to spend time with, because all Robespierre would do is just lecture you constantly about morals and virtue. Um, in, in the simplest of terms, I almost picture the relationship as um, Squidward and, and Spongebob, with Robespierre as the Squidward and Danton as the Spongebob. Uh, but they were usually uh, the two main figures working towards the same goals within the Jacobin faction for a really long time. As journalists like Marat and especially Hebert, uh, who we covered last episode, became more and more violent and insulting in their writings, Robespierre spoke out in their defense. This Robespierre quote in defense of the freedom of the press, I think we think also illustrates how he saw himself and the world around him and speaks directly to the often unpopular positions he stubbornly clung to. 
incorruptible men who have no other passion besides the well-being and glory of their country do not dread the public expression of the sentiments of their fellow citizens. They know only too well that it is not easy to lose their esteem when one can counter calumny with an irreproachable life and proof of disinterested zeal. If they are sometimes victims of a passing persecution, this is for them the badge of their glory, the brilliant testimony of their virtue. They rest assured with gentle confidence in the suffering of a... Again, um, I just like to point out the phrase disinterested zeal, because uh, again, he, he ties in these sort of contradictory concepts just in the phrases he uses quite a bit. Um, but disinterested zeal uh, is another of those sort of classic Robespierre phrases. And it's also, too. I mean, um, with political, well, dis disinterested zeal politically is like, you're not uh, preaching. Well, this is what part of what uh, his later uh, conflict with Danton becomes, is you're not, uh, your zeal is not resulting from, I'm going to make money off of this, or I have a financial or a uh, family interest in it, is that you're, you're disinterested in yourself, and the zeal is towards the, the broader picture. Uh, where Denton definitely, he said he's of the attitude, as we're going to see later, it gets more and more, where he's in the revolution, and he thinks revolutionaries should have fun, revolutionaries should be able to enrich themselves, why not make money while we're at it? Uh, and Robespierre is just absolutely opposed to that whole concept. From the very beginning of his political career to his death, he furiously opposed slavery, both in France itself and in the French Caribbean colonies, whose entire economies revolved around uh, around slavery. Back in 1791, when the white representatives from French colonies tried to get a guarantee from the convention maintaining slavery, Robespierre gave a furious speech saying that maintaining slavery would betray every ideal the revolution had and make all they had said about freedom and equality into obvious hypocrisy. The one point a lot of America's founding fathers these days get a lot of criticism for ignoring. Unfortunately, this position of Robespierre's was a very unpopular one at the time, and although he came very close to abolishing slavery by 1794, his fall from power would come about before any of it was implemented. Well, Robespierre had technically been uh, out of power in some sense during the constitutional monarchy phase of the revolution, having you know written himself out with that uh, self-denying ordinance saying you couldn't be reelected. Uh, he had still been around and staying in Paris and getting involved with the, the local Paris government. He'd been writing and giving speeches and, uh, again, opposing things like the decision to declare war, but uh, wasn't able to actually stop it. But he was also spending a lot of time, uh, along with his allies, organizing citizen militias and protecting common soldiers from their aristocratic and upper-class officers. When the king eventually used his constitutional veto to try and protect those non-juring priests we had mentioned in the last episode, uh, the events that, yeah. When the king eventually used his constitutional veto to try and protect those non juring priests that we'd mentioned in the last episode, the events we covered uh, really started to snowball as we described them last time. Uh, the French National Guard and the local Paris government, known as the Paris Commune, uh, overthrew the king and the legislative assembly, removing the king from power completely and officially designating France uh, as entirely a republic. And at that point, they needed to call another constitutional convention because the constitution they'd already written uh, had a very big role in it for the king, who they had just uh, gotten rid of. So the deputies were elected uh, for that by universal manhood suffrage, and Robespierre again found himself back in a legislative body, helping to create another new constitution for France. When his allies in the Haveras faction carried out those September massacres of priests and prisoners that we discussed last episode, Robespierre was accused by his enemies of allowing these massacres to happen uh, and for his ties to the people who'd carried them out. And ultimately, he ends up uttering another one of his many famous Robespierre quotes in his own defense, saying, do you want a revolution without a revolution? Uh, it was in his speech regarding the fate of the now imprisoned and overthrown King Louis, however, that Robespierre's infamy really began to take off. As uh, one of the very respected new leaders of a newly powerful political faction, and as a lawyer who was borderline obsessed with the legal and moral implications of the death penalty, Robespierre's opinion on this issue of executing the king and whether or not to give him a trial carried a whole lot of weight. In 1792, Robespierre gave another long and eloquent speech uh, and came out in favor of sending the king to the guillotine. Um, he said, quote, as for myself, I abhor the death penalty administered by your laws, and for Louis, I have neither love nor hate. I hate only his crimes. 
I have demanded the abolition of the death penalty at your constituent assembly, and I am not to blame if the first principles of reason appeared to you as moral political heresies. But if you will never reclaim these principles in favor of so much evil, the crimes which belongs less to you and more to the government, by what fatal error would you remember yourselves and plead for the greatest of criminals? You ask an exemption to the death penalty for him alone who could legitimize it. Yes, the death penalty is in general a crime, unjustifiable by the indestructible principles of nature, except in cases protecting the safety of individuals or the society altogether. Ordinary misdemeanors have never threatened public safety, because, the society, because society may always protect itself by other means, making those culpable powerless to harm it. But a king dethroned in the bosom of a revolution, which, as yet, which is as yet cemented only by laws, a king whose name attracts the scourge of war upon the troubled nation. Neither prison nor exile can render his existence inconsequential to public happiness. This cruel exemption to ordinary laws avowed by justice can be imputed only to the nature of his crimes. With regret, I pronounce this fatal truth. Louis must die so that the nation may live. And this, uh, again, as you see, he's, he's apologizing. He's standing by his opposition to the death penalty except for this one exception for the greater good. And that's the exception that he'll end up uh, coming back to again and again as uh, political intrigues start to surround him and his own power increases. Um, but it really is, in his mind, it's for the greater good. Um, Danton, of course, also voted for the death penalty for the king without trial. And the uh, theory of the Hebarist faction and the mob was something that Danton saw as a useful tool for resisting those who would threaten the revolution. And he responded to the king's death sentence, uh, again, with the, the eye on the war that was going on, saying, the kings of Europe would dare challenge us, we'll throw them the head of the king. This was surprising in a lot of ways, but if Robespierre was going to argue in favor of the death penalty in this case, it was a huge deal. The assembly voted in favor, and Louis was sent to the guillotine, and soon after, the reign of terror would begin. After the king had been executed, Danton and Robespierre found their faction uh, with a lot more power. They'd both been out of power in the last legislature, and thus weren't part of the decision to start a war and then start losing it. They'd both been building up their reputation with the common people of Paris and the angry mob stirred up by Marat and Hebert, and the people we discussed last week. And they both were swept back into uh, back into power on the wave of popular support. So together with the support of much of Paris behind them, their faction managed to arrest their political rivals in the Girondin faction and then sent them to the guillotine as enemies of the people. Robespierre by 1794 had taken his one-time exception to the death penalty and turned it into a, a general exception. Uh, from executing the king as an enemy of the people who was too dangerous to keep alive to executing more and more enemies of the people who were also too dangerous to keep alive. By 1794, he would give yet another famous speech, uh, this one actually one of his most infamous, on the subject of the political terror. He said in part, what is the fundamental principle of democratic or popular government? That is to say, the essential mainspring upon which it depends and which makes it function. It is virtue, I mean public virtue. That virtue is nothing else but the love of the fatherland and its laws. The splendor of the goal of the French Revolution is simultaneously the source of our strength and of our weakness. Our strength because it gives us ascendancy of truth over falsehoods and of public rights over private interests. Our weakness because it rallies against us all vicious men, all those who in their hearts seek to despoil the people. It is necessary to stifle the domestic and foreign enemies of the Republic or perish with them. Now in these circumstances, the first maxim of our politics ought to be to lead the people by means of reason and the enemies of the people by terror. The basis of popular government in times of revolution is both virtue and terror. Terror without virtue is murderous. Virtue without terror is powerless. Terror is nothing else but swift, severe, indomitable justice. It flows then from virtue. So again, this virtue, terror, uh, sort of good and evil mindset that he had that really dominated his thoughts um, really starts to take off once he's in a position to actually start killing people as long as he can convince the assembly to let him do it. Um, and he's in a position to be very, very good at convincing the assembly to let him do it. Um, and it definitely is, is part of how he views the world. It's there's, there's nature, there's truth, there's all things good, and then there are those who would seek to destroy it. And it becomes increasingly black and white of a worldview as it goes on. In quick succession, Robespierre, Saint Juice, and several others assumed near dictatorial emergency powers as the Committee of Public Safety, 
a move proposed and passed by Danton, though he would not be a part of the committee. As the Cult of Reason sees Notre Dame, the Infernal Columns violently enforce the de-Christianization of France in the countryside, Robespierre remained at best an uneasy ally with his religious views serving as the main point of division in that alliance. As far back as 1792, Robespierre, in spite of his increasing importance within the Jacobin faction, had received a lot of scorn and pushback from his supporters for expressing his religious views publicly. While the cult of reason grew more and more powerful, and atheists like Hebert and Mamoro began dreaming of the world's first atheistic state, Robespierre once again dug his heels and decided to stand by his deist beliefs. Though he supported moves against the Catholic Church and non-adjuring priests, his consistent belief in a supreme being was a point on which he was unmovable, no matter how unpopular those views made him. Following a moment of good luck, Robespierre had thanked God when his fellow Jacobins expressed shock that he'd say something like that when destroying the influence of the church and superstition was one of, the, one of, was one of their core goals. He had chosen to double down and lecture everyone in the room about his religious beliefs in more detail. Quote, There is nothing superstitious in using the name of the deity. I believe myself in those eternal principles on which human weakness reposes before it starts on the path of virtue. These are not idle words in my mouth, any more than they have been idle words in the mouths of many great men, nonetheless moral of their belief in the existence of God. When the other Jacobins shouted at him, uh, he'd gone even further, saying, yes, it is hazardous to invoke the name of providence and express the ideas of the eternal being who intimately affects the destinies of nations and who seems to me to watch over the revolution in a specific way. But my belief is heartfelt. It is a feeling I cannot dispense with. I needed it to sustain me in the National Assembly, surrounded by those passions, vile intrigues, so many enemies. How could I have carried out tasks that required superhuman strength if I had not nurtured my isolated soul? About a year later, in 1793, while the cult of reason was near the height of its power, his religious opinions were no less controversial. Again, he voiced public opposition to atheism and explained how his religious opposition was something he viewed as inherently political and revolutionary. Quote, It will be said, perhaps, that I am a narrow-minded man, a prejudiced person, a fanatic. As I have already said, I do not speak as a private individual or a sympathetic philosopher, but as a representative of the people. Atheism is aristocratic. The conception of a great being who watches over oppressed innocence and punishes successful crime is democratic through and through. I have been a poor sort of Catholic since my college days, but I have never cooled in my friendship for or failed in my championship of my fellow man. Indeed, I have only grown more wedded to the moral and political ideals that I have expressed." End quote. Now when he said this last quote, he was already voting to purge the enemies of the people by sending them in droves to the guillotine, but with his virtue and terror outlook, he saw that as a sacrifice he made in defense of the people. Uh, again, virtue without terror being powerless. Um, Saint-Just, who during Robespierre and Danton's rise had left Paris for a while to serve as political commissioner of the French armies, uh, had gone and purged a lot of the unpopular and incompetent officers on the advice of common soldiers in the armies. It's not clear how much of an impact he actually had, but the poor performance of the army really turned around and the invading armies had been turned away, uh, something for which he tried to take as much credit as possible before rejoining Robespierre in Paris to sit on the Committee of Public Safety. As Robespierre doubled down on his anti-atheistic statements and started laying the groundwork for the cult of the supreme being, uh, St. Juice would come out to defend his friend uh, over and over against all who opposed him, especially the cult of reason, but basically anyone who would stand in their way, uh, saying, quote, The Republic is built on the ruins of everything anti-Republican. There are three sins against the Republic. One is to be sorry for state prisoners, another is to be opposed to the rule of virtue, the third is to be opposed to the terror. While Robespierre was overwhelmingly the main ideological force behind the cult of the supreme being, St. Juice would be really its most brutal enforcer. The conflict between Robespierre and the cult of reason came to a head shortly after the uh, cult of reason had held that big triumphant festival of reason in Notre Dame. Uh, and that was an event that made Robespierre absolutely furious. Uh, so this is where we ended the last episode.
Um, the Festival of Reason involved uh, provocatively dressed women, and Robespierre was often described as a prude, and some people think this was a big part of his opposition, but it was really more um, his long-standing opposition to atheism as anti-democratic and pro-aristocratic in his mind, and also uh, the fact that they were doing what, uh, with their cult of reason, what he'd been planning on doing with his cult of the supreme being for a while, and they essentially beat him to the punch. Um, and sort of undermined his religious vision uh, for the future of France. Sorry. The Festival of Reason was really the last straw for Robespierre, and it was uh, Robespierre who blocked it from officially becoming the religion of France and stopped the public uh, and stopped the official support for the cult of reason. And Danton, who'd been briefly out of the picture considering retirement from politics, uh, came back into Paris to help rally support against the Hevera's faction and against the cult of reason. When Hebert found out that Robespierre, Danton, and the Jacobin faction were all starting to turn against him, he attempted to mobilize the people of Paris to overthrow Robespierre, the way he had once helped mobilize them to overthrow the Girondins and sweep Robespierre and Danton into power in the first place. But for the most part, he decided to throw another revolution and nobody showed up. There were a lot of factors, including the popularity of Robespierre and Danton, uh, and also the fact that this was five years into the revolution and people were getting tired of all these uh, uprisings over and over. But in the end, Hebert and most of the leaders of the Cult of Reason were arrested, rounded up, and quickly sent to the guillotine by Robespierre and Denton. Um, Hebert was mocked and belittled by the same crowds he had once been so good at entertaining, and he went to his death along with his uh, wife Marie, the former nun, as, as well as Mamoro, Klutz, and almost all of the leaders of the Cult of Reason. Uh, Danton, though he played a major role in bringing the Cult of Reason to an end and helping Robespierre out with this, would not outlive them by very long. His own, his own indulgent lifestyle had really annoyed the enragés and a lot of the people in the Cult of Reason for a while, which is partly why he was so willing to come in and try and take them down. Um, but it annoyed Robespierre quite a bit as well, and his opposition to the revolutionary terror that he'd helped start um, was really a, a big political point for him, where he started saying, all right, well, maybe we should guillotine people a bit less. And Robespierre, you know, and, and St. Just, with their whole opposition to the terrorist treason, um, really were not into this idea. Uh, but it was really his love of wealth and his extravagant lifestyle um, that was used as a pretext for his execution. There were people in Danton's faction who had been caught in these sort of corrupt war profiteering schemes that had made everybody really furious. And Danton's actual connection to these scandals um, seemed to be that they were carried out by people who were friends of his, but he had quite a lot of friends. So the actual connection's fairly shaky. But nonetheless, he was convicted of these corruption charges and sent to the guillotine. And with that, basically Robespierre's last real rival was gone and he was at the height of his power. As Danton went to the guillotine, uh, he had two statements. One, he said, I leave it all in a frightful welter. Not a man of them left has an idea of government. Robespierre will follow me. He is dragged down by me. Uh, better to be a poor fisherman than to meddle with the government of men. In his typical and boisterously self-deprecating manner, his last words were, show my head to the people, it's well worth seeing. Danton's predictions about the future proved very accurate, but before he was brought down, Robespierre would try to use his moment at the height of political power to finally cure all the religious tensions that had been devastating France for so long by unveiling the new religion he had been working on, the Cult of the Supreme Being. We've been alluding to the cult of the Supreme Being for a while now, and given how much we've talked about Robespierre's character, you can probably guess a lot about how it was structured. He made claims about how it represented all of France, how it was the will of the people. He mentions virtue and purity when talking about the cult, just as much as he does when he's talking about politics. After all the terror and intrigue and danger and holier-than-thou posturing, the incorruptible finally had his chance to make all the bloodshed worth it and proclaim that the bad times were over and the future was bright. On the 20th of Prairial, year two, that is June 8th, 1794, Robespierre had what one biographer described as the happiest day of his life. Just like the 1793 Festival of Reason had been intended to usher in the new age of the Cult of Reason, the Cult of the Supreme Being was introduced as the new religion of France with a massive festival. Robespierre had worked really hard on this, and the festival intended to emphasize natural themes, wisdom, and enlightenment ideals. Of course, Robespierre would be at the center of the festival, delivering the opening speech and introducing his ideas about the Supreme Being to adoring crowds. While Robespierre worked hard on planning the festival, 
Most of it was put together by Jacques David, a Jacobin and friend of Robespierre, who happened to be one of the greatest artists of the age. If you've seen any paintings from this era, uh, then you've absolutely seen the work of David, who painted Napoleon. If you go to Wikipedia pages of half the people we've talked about, their portraits are by David. The morning of the festival, Robespierre was literally too nervous to eat breakfast. He was seeing the children scattering flowers around outside, men and women with garlands in their hair, and said to a friend, Nature, how sublime, how delightful thy power. How the tyrants must turn pale at the thought of this festival. He wore a large posy on his outfit, made of flowers and leaves, which was made for him by his dear friend and possible secret fiance, Eleanor Duple, but he ran out of the house all excited that he forgot it and had to run back. While he was getting ready, the recently used guillotine had been moved a bit out of sight of the festival grounds. I think with all these flowers, as much as he loves it, just my allergies, I, I would hate it so much. <laughs> like, uh, um, you want to go there? Oh, sure. Huge crowds had turned out in Paris for this festival, and he started it by giving yet another of his very long speeches, this one all about deism and how the supreme being was going to unite France. Uh, he goes on for quite a while in front of this crowd uh, about the triumph of good over evil, of democracy over tyranny, and ending his speech saying, Hatred of bad faith and tyranny burns in our hearts with love of justice and the fatherland. Our blood flows for the cause of humanity. Behold our prayer, behold our sacrifices, behold the worship we offer thee. At this point, David handed him a torch, and he set fire to the very large and confusing statue that nobody really knew what it was supposed to be, uh, but it was a statue that represented atheism, and as it burned, a statue of wisdom was revealed underneath. Robespierre then gave another speech, the text of which we'll provide the, the link to in the show notes. Uh, the day ended with ancient Greek-style athletic competitions, although the contestants were wearing a lot more clothes than in the original Olympics. The festival seemed to go well enough, but the main reaction to Robespierre's big day by the people was, what? Most people seemed just really, really confused by the whole thing, and apart from his close circle of friends, his new religion ended up having almost no followers, which is why we've been talking so much about Robespierre this episode, because he is the cult of the supreme being. It's very, very few people other than just him. Um, and this uh, really did not work out well for him at all. Uh, unlike the atheist religion, which was easy for people to get into, uh, his deist cult of the supreme being, deism existed and continues to exist as a sort of way of picking and choosing, of identifying which elements uh, in a specific religion are important to you as an individual, and a way of reconciling rational enlightenment beliefs with older religious traditions. But as it turned out, it doesn't really work as a standalone religion being dictated by somebody else. Even the other deists thought that Robespierre was being ridiculous, and some of the elected officials in the festival were making fun of him behind his back while he was giving these speeches. Far from ushering in a new religious age for France, replacing the Catholic Church, and making the atheists calm down, all that this new religion accomplished was basically just alienating a lot of people and reducing a lot of Robespierre's political support. While the de-Christianization efforts of the cult of reason had a major impact on the religious landscape of France that persists to this day, the cult of being fizzled out almost immediately. Um, like the cult of reason, the first festival celebrating the supreme being would also be the last. If you were using the old calendar, as most people in France still were, the day of the festival was seen as falling on the Pentecost, and street preachers began spreading rumors about Robespierre as an end times prophet, and these were not uh, favorable street preachers. Um, his vanity and his status as a cult leader was really played up a great deal by these rumors, and his political rivals used that, and the festival definitely won him no friends. Within a few months of the festival, Robespierre and St. Juice would find themselves calling for yet another purge of rivals, aimed at rooting out a conspiracy or possible coup being planned by uh, a surviving atheist general uh, and possible cult of reason associate who had been out of Paris commanding troops in the countryside and was thus able to avoid the purge of the Abaris faction. For once, Robespierre and St. Juice were unable to give a long speech and convince the assembly to support them. In addition to a few survivors who were more friendly to the Abaris side, there were also surviving friends of Danton in the assembly, and having purged the leaders of these factions, Robespierre was no longer able to count on their support. In response to rumors of a coup, he asked them to support one last purge, but refused to name the traitors, adopting more of a they know who they are stance, which of course caused almost everyone to start thinking, is he talking about me? Denounced as traitors by the convention, 
Robespierre, St. Juice, and the rest of his allies were arrested in an event known as the Thermidorian Reaction, as it took place on 9 Thermidor, or July 27th. And while the Paris Commune did mobilize for a rescue attempt, this failed, and Robespierre, St. Juice, and his allies were all led to the guillotine the next day. Robespierre was unable to give a final speech, as sometime during the escape attempt the night before, he had been shot in the jaw, either by an officer trying to arrest him or by himself in a suicide attempt, depending on which source you believe. Uh, as he was led to the guillotine, the bandage holding his shattered jaw in place was ripped off, and he let out an agonized scream, which was ended by the guillotine's blade. With his death, the cult of the Supreme Being came to a very abrupt end, only a few months after it started. Though the cult of reason and the cult of the Supreme Being were both suddenly decapitated when their leaders were, and neither lasted very long at all, the anti-clerical sentiments they both espoused did spread across France, and the de-Christianization was at least partly successful in spreading atheist and deist ideologies. The de-Christianization of France, which slowed down considerably after the cult of reason was destroyed, ultimately came to an end with the rise of Napoleon, who passed a law officially outlawing both cults and negotiated a deal with the Pope to restore the Catholic Church as the official religion of France, with some specific caveats that ensured it didn't conflict with his political ambition. And with that, I'm Michael Albaney, here with Patrick Reynolds, and we want to thank you for joining us on this two-part exploration of the new religious movements during the French Revolution. Uh, if you want to know more about sex ed and our upcoming episodes, please follow us on Facebook and Twitter, both at sex ed. And you can also find our website, www.sexed.com, where you can contact us and let us know what other religious movements you want us to cover in future episodes. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albaney and Patrick Reynolds, and was edited by Patrick Reynolds. Sex Ed is created under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It was recorded at LEADER, the Lab for the Education and Advancement in Digital Research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.